Matthew chapter 12 this morning. I want to ask you quickly, have you ever been confused about what was going on with someone? You, you, uh, you hear their story, you, you listen to what they say, and you think, man, I just don't know what in the world is going on. And probably most of us have been there. Even the most professional and analytical people in the world have that uh, problem sometimes, just trying to figure it out. As a matter of fact, I ran across, let me share some things that are supposedly actual records on medical charts. These were actually written on uh, some medical charts, and it'll kind of illustrate what I'm talking about, about maybe being a little confused about what someone's going through. Here's just several of them. Uh, one doctor wrote, the patient has chest pains if she lies on her left side for over a year. Um, uh, one said, on the second day, the knee was better, and on the third day, it disappeared. The patient is tearful and crying constantly. She also appears to be depressed. One doctor said, the patient has been depressed since she began seeing me in 1993. Um, some of you may, uh, may feel that way. Um, one said, discharge status, alive, but without my permission. Uh, so I hope, I'm glad you're alive this morning, even if you didn't get the doctor's uh, permission. Uh, one said, healthy, uh, appearing decrepit, 69-year-old male, mentally alert, but forgetful. This is one of my favorite here. The patient refused autopsy. Um, uh, here's one. The patient has no previous history of suicides. You just wonder what doctors are thinking when they write down uh, the, this information. Uh, Patient's medical history has been remarkable, remarkably insignificant with only a 40-pound weight gain in the last three days. Uh, boy, I'm telling you what, I feel like I suffer from that disease sometimes there. But um, this one wrote, she is numb from her toes down. Um, one, uh, one doctor wrote, patient was alert and unresponsive. Um, this is one of my favorites. Patient has two teenage children, but no other abnormalities. Uh, that's one of my favorite, especially if you have, uh, have had teen children. I read that to you this morning just simply uh, to illustrate that everybody has some challenges from time to time glancing at someone, understanding someone, and trying to analyze what's going on uh, in their world. What is their, their life uh, about? Well, such is the case this morning in our series. We have been talking about incredible and impossible, about the miracles of Jesus. And today we're going to continue that as we look at what I'm calling a glimpse of God. Uh, you know, just like these doctors looked at someone and, and their analysis was a little different, Jesus went through the same thing. Jesus walked on this, world, this earth 33 and a half years. He had about a three and a half year ministry. And as he walked upon, uh, among the people of that day and performed miracles and lived and, and lived out uh, what, what his father had called him to do, um, we saw a glimpse of God. But many people, when they, when they saw Christ, they were somewhat confused about what his purpose was. And so let me just, I want to ask you if you will this morning, uh, let's stand for the reading of God's Word, and we'll just read a few verses, and then we'll, ref we'll refer back. Matthew chapter 12, begin reading in verse 1. Matthew says this, At that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and, it is, and His disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priest? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. 
But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the, the reality of what um, you did in this world in those years that you were here. And Lord, we're grateful for what you do in our world and in our lives today. And now, Lord, I ask your blessings on the reading of your word. May you use it uh, in our hearts and lives today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. As you come to this passage of Scripture, there are some interesting things going on. Once again, uh, a miracle of Christ. And uh, something interesting happens. Jesus and his disciples are walking through the fields on the Sabbath. And as they walk through the fields, his, dis his disciples are a little hungry. And so as you and I probably would, they just take their hands and, and they kind of breeze along the grain and they pull some heads of grain and they put it in their hand and they probably uh, squ squish it like that a little bit, break it up, kind of move it around and let the wind blow the chaff away. And then they eat the grain. Well, if you know anything about the, the, the ministry of Christ, Christ had some people who followed him, but not because they loved him, not because they were amazed by him or interested in him, but rather they followed him simply because they wanted to find fault with him. And uh, these folks were called uh, the scribes and the Pharisees. And, and so they began to look at Jesus. And as we read this story, uh, the first eight verses, this is what's happened. As, after the disciples have moved through the fields, these, these scribes and Pharisees have watched this. And they've watched them eat. And uh, they begin to say, you know what? That is unlawful. You can't do that on the Sabbath. And so they begin to find fault with him. We're going to look back at this passage in a minute. It, it continues on and Jesus goes in and he finds a, 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 a person who needs to be healed, a paralytic if you will, and uh, he heals them on the Sabbath. Once again, these people find fault. They begin to criticize and they begin to, to say all kinds of things and question Christ about what he was doing. And it's interesting in this passage, Jesus speaks to the scribes and Pharisees and he teaches them something, a truth or a couple of truths that I think transcend the ages. It was a truth that these people needed to understand that day, but it is also a truth that, that the world in general needs to understand. And I want to look at two of those truths this morning as we look at this passage, as we talk about a glimpse of God. Because actually what is taking place in this passage is that the scribes and Pharisees are watching Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, and they're getting a glimpse of what God is like, and they, they misunderstand it. They misinterpret it. And so Jesus speaks into this situation, and he reveals two truths. And I want to share those with you. If you're following along in your worship guide this morning, there's some places to take notes on the back if you would like to do that. But two truths primarily. Let me share the first. Notice with me in chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. Jesus said this, Yet I say unto you that in this temple place there is one greater than the temple but if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. The first truth that Jesus teaches us as we take a glimpse of God is this. God's Word is designed to reveal a loving God, not just make us feel guilty. God's Word is designed to, make, to, to reveal a loving God, not just to make us feel guilty. Guilty. There's a lot of confusion about the Bible today. Some think it's a, it's a book, it's, a, uh, it's kind of archaic, and its primary responsibility is to make us unhappy. That's what a lot of people think. You know, the Bible, it's just an old book, and it's, it's just, you know, all it is is a bunch of rules and regulations, and, and, and the Bible is something that just is kind of, it limits our life, and they, they, it restricts us. But I want to tell you that that is not the intention of God's Word. The Bible is designed to help us, yes, one, it does, it is designed to help us to realize our guilt. As a matter of fact, Romans chapter 7, verse 7, the Apostle Paul said this, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. 
For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. The Apostle Paul says, yes, the Word of God, it is a book that that helps reveal our sin. Paul says, I wouldn't have known that something was wrong if the Word of God hadn't told me it was wrong. And so as we read God's Word, yes, there is an element that we read and we look and say, okay, yes, I'm a sinner, but it's more than that. So often people look at, at the Bible and they'll say, you know what, it's just, it's just restrictions. But what Jesus is saying in chapter 12 is I have not come to make you just feel guilty. I am come to help you understand what God is like. Notice in verse 7 or verse 6 again, Yet I say that in this place there is one greater than the temple. The scribes and Pharisees were caught up in the temple and the building itself. And Jesus says, hey, I am here. I am God and I am greater than this temple. He also says in verse verse 7, if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Once again, he is revealing something about God. It's not designed just to make us guilty. It is designed to reveal God. As you, enter the New Test- as you enter the New Testament period, in order to understand these scribes and Pharisees, uh, there's a little bit of background and why they were such a stickler. They had so many laws. Uh, the New Testament laws of that day, the Sabbath, had become very stringent. The Pharisees and the leaders had set up certain laws to try to protect people from breaking the commands. Uh, A lot of times the scribes and Pharisees get a bad rap in this sense. Uh, We look at them and say, man, they were just legalists. They were were terrible people. But but what has happened in in, in history is God had told His people, if you don't obey my law, you're going to go into captivity. I'm going to punish you if you don't obey my law. And so you know the story of the children of Israel. They didn't obey, and God called out to them and said, I I want to protect you, I want to help you. And they continued to disobey God. And God sent them into captivity. And when they came out of captivity, the, the priest of that day said, we don't ever want that to happen again. We don't ever want God to judge us that way again. So we, and and we understand that God judged us because we did not obey His law. So we need to make sure that we obey His law to the fullest. And so they began this process of looking at every law and saying, okay, how can we adhere to this law? How can we keep from breaking this law? And they had begun to come up with one thing after the other. As it relates to the Sabbath, the fourth commandment, in the Hebrew, contained 39 words. And so they had come up with 39 ways that you could break the Sabbath. And if that wasn't enough, they they had broken down uh, those into divisions into more than 39 divisions. So ultimately, there was 1,521 ways you could break the the Sabbath laws. (laughs) And these scribes and these Pharisees and these priests, they knew exactly what they were. Let me just share some of them just to show you how far-fetched they had went. They said if you had a nail or a tack in your sandal on the Sabbath, then you were carrying a burden. Violation. You know, the Sabbath said you can't carry a burden. You can't do any work on this. uh, Or the law said you can't do any of this work on the Sabbath. And so they said, you know what? If you step on a tack, you're carrying something that you're not supposed to carry. So that's a burden and you're, you're in violation. They said if you get a flea on you and you try to kill him on the Sabbath, you're hunting. So, so on, on the, on the Sabbath... You just had to let the flea bite you. And whatever it did, whatever fleas do, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't try to, you couldn't go to your wife or, or you couldn't take your kid and try to figure out where that flea was because then you were hunting and that was a violation of the Sabbath. If you had a toothache, you could not put vinegar in your mouth because you would be trying to heal and you couldn't heal on the Sabbath. Do you see how, how far-fetched these had come? Uh, here was one, you better not eat an egg that a hen laid on the Sabbath because then you would be eating something that was produced by work on the Sabbath. You say, Randall, that's that's just craziness. 
Yes, it is craziness in the sense that they had created all of these laws, but the, but the scribes and the priests had said, you know what? We want you to understand that the Sabbath is so vitally important, and, 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 and if you do something wrong, we want, you to, we want you to realize what you have done wrong. Here's all of these laws. And Jesus comes along, and he, he essentially, he doesn't go by their 1,521 Sabbath laws. Actually, he begins to not intentionally break them, but in part of what he was doing, he was trying to help them to understand, you know what, it's not about this set of laws. It's about who I am. And the Word of God, from the beginning to the end, it is about revealing a God that loves us. This Jesus came in the flesh so that we could see what God was like. As Jesus walked along the earth and He reached down and He healed someone, He was intentionally doing so that, so that people would look and say, you know what, if He is God, then God must be compassionate. He, he, would, he would do that so that people would look and say, God must be caring. He would live right and he would say no wrong and he would respond in, in, in the correct ways so that people would say, if he is God, then God must be holy and God must be just. And Jesus was God in the flesh. And, and what Jesus wanted these scribes and Pharisees to understand is that I've not come. The Word of God is not designed just, to, just to, for you to walk around on eggshells and feel like you're guilty about everything. The Word of God, yes, it reveals our guilt, but primarily it is to reveal a God that loves you and, and cares about me and wants us to be uh, all that, that He wants us to be. As a matter of fact... Psalm 119, you don't have to turn there, but if you want to mark it, there's a wonderful passage in Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the longest psalm or the longest chapter in the Bible, and there's some interesting things. Psalm 119 is primarily devoted to God's Word. Let me just read a few verses that give us some insight into God's Word here. Psalm 119, verse, verse 9 says this, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate upon your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Do you see the difference in, in, in David's estimation of God's word? He says, oh, I love it. It is so good for me. God's word is so good to, to be in my heart. And, and that's one of the things as we have, have founded this church, as, as we started Clearview, one of the things that I go back to, Clearview Church is going to be a church that shares God's word. I want everything that we do to be based upon Scripture. And, and, and if I preach something, if it, I want you to look it up. If it's not according to Scripture, let me know. But the thing about it is we are founded in the Scripture. Why? Because the Scripture cleanses our way. The Scripture guides and directs our path. And there's a world of people today, and, and if, if you don't know Christ, you maybe uh, have that idea that the Bible, it's just about it's just about making me feel bad. No, the Bible reveals all of the stories of David's sin and Samson's sin and Peter's denial. Why does it share that? Because it wants you and I to understand that there is a God that is full of grace and compassion. And although you and I may be guilty and we may have sinned, God's Word is testimony that we can be forgiven. Around our house, we've got, a, we've got a little dog. Sometimes I wish we didn't have a little dog, but we have a little dog. And um, his name's Baxter, and he's a miniature schnauzer. And he's an interesting uh, 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 fella. And, and one of the things that uh, always amazes me about Baxter is, is if you talk to him just right, he'll cower. In his ear. Matter of fact, you don't even have to talk to him mean. 
Sometimes I can just look at him like this. And he'll, he'll, his ears will lay down and, and he'll know he's in trouble. If he does something wrong and you walk in and you say, Baxter, what have you done? He just wilts. But it's amazing. If you'll walk over to him, and I usually just grab him by the face and I'll just ruffle his, his head or scrub him down the back. And all of a sudden, he perks up, his ears perk back up. And why? Because here at that moment, when, when, when I speak to him, when he does something wrong, he realizes that and that guilt just wilts him. But when his owner, when his master's, Reach down and touch him. And, and can I say that it's not only dogs, it's our children as well. Children do that. When we reach into their life and, 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 and you pet them and you say, hey, yeah, you did wrong, but I want you to know this, this, uh, this hug is to show you that I love you. If something amazing happens, they inflate. And they, they begin to realize, okay, yeah, I did wrong, but I'm still loved. Do you know what? That's exactly what God does. That's exactly what the Bible does. We come to God's Word and we read Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and this is what we do. Oh. But then we read John three sixteen for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And you know what God is doing? He's reaching out with His hand and He's saying, hey, I love you. And you know what that does in our life? It says, okay, God still loves me. And so Jesus is displaying to these people that, that God's Word is not just about making us feel guilt. It is about revealing a loving God. But secondly, let me share this truth with you. Jesus came to demonstrate compassion, not just condemnation. Once again, people think that, that Jesus came just for this. Take your Bible and, uh, and let's go to a, a passage of Scripture that uh, many of you may know. Let's go over to John chapter 3, verse 16, if you have your Bibles. This is probably one of the most well-known verses in the Bible. Um, John chapter 3, verse 16, many of you may even be able to quote it. Uh, but, but I don't want to just read this one verse. I want us to go a little further to help you understand what I'm saying. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have, have everlasting life. Stop right there. In that verse, it tells us, number one, that we are going to perish. God doesn't want us to perish. But, but John 3.16 does tell us that we have done something that deserves punishment. But God loved us so much that He didn't want us to have that punishment. So He, he, he sent His Son in, in verse 16. But let's go one more verse. Sometimes we stop before we get to this verse. Jesus is speaking of Himself. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Jesus is saying, yes, uh, yes, you, you, I came and you were facing condemnation, but I came into this world so that you wouldn't have to face condemnation. I came to show compassion. Romans 8, 1, the Apostle Paul said this, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What, Jesus, what, what Paul is saying is that Jesus came, and when He died on the cross, He took all of the sin of the world, and at that moment, guess what? He condemned sin. He took the punishment of sin so that you and I would not have to face that. But let's go back to our passage this morning in Matthew chapter 12 as we hurry to a close. Matthew chapter 12, let's notice verse 18. Jesus speaking, he quotes an Old Testament passage out of Isaiah, and he says this, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. 
I will put my spirit upon him and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoking flax he will not quench till he sends forth justice to victory. And in his name, Gentiles will trust. Just two things that I want to point out this morning about Jesus' ministry. Yes, he did not come to condemn us, but to show us compassion. And how did he do that? Verse 18 tells us, behold my servant. He came to serve us. Jesus' whole life and ministry was about serving. Anywhere he went, he was reaching into people's lives. He was speaking encouragement. He was raising the dead. He was healing the sick. He was feeding the hungry. He, he, was, he was encouraging the downcast. He was befriending the un, those who had no friends. And the Bible says so much so that he was so much so a servant that he died for our sin and now he ascended into heaven. And if you, and if you know anything about the book of Hebrews, the, the book of Hebrews tells us that right now Christ is doing something for us. And that is he is interceding for us. You know what? He's still serving. This very moment, this very moment in heaven, Christ is at the throne of his Father. And he's saying, Father, would you help Randall right now as he, as he preaches? Would you help him as he shares the gospel? But he's not just praying for me, he's praying for you. What is it you're facing this week? What, what have you faced this past week? What are you facing this coming week? Well, whatever it is, can I tell you that right now Christ is there before the throne and he's calling out your name and he's saying, Father, your son, your daughter... They've got to make a huge decision, and they need wisdom. Will you impart wisdom into their life? This morning, Father, they, they are downcast. They are burdened. Uh, this morning, Lord, they have three or four kids. They really need your help, whatever the case may be. Lord, Lord, that they are ailing. Father, would you speak into that? He ever lives to intercede for us. Why? Because his whole life is about serving, but not just that. Notice with me back in verse 21, 20 and verse 21, a beautiful picture. He came to save us. Look at verse 20 and 21. This word picture, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will, be, will trust. The, bru the bruised reed depicts those who have uh, been beaten up. A reed was just a small vine, if you will, just a, a straw, just a small straw. And it was easily broken and bruised. And the thing about it is, once a, a reed was broken, it was, it was of no value. They just tossed them aside. They had lost all value and, and they were just, they were plentiful around. And so if, if you had a reed and you were using it for something and it broke or, 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 or was bruised, you could just cast it aside and get another one. But notice what he said. He said he's essentially saying that we are like those reeds. And he said, Christ came and a bruised reed he will not cast aside. What he's saying, the people of this society who are broken and bruised he's not going to cast them to the side he is going to hold on to them he's going to hold them in the palm of his hand he is going to care for those it, it depicts those that are broken by life damaged by heart and mind a person who may be weakless and helpless and hopeless it depicts all of us who were dead in our transgressions and our sins it depicts those of us who were bruised by the enemy and we've fallen short of the glory of God and our enemy and the world around us says you know what if you don't have anything to offer guess what They'll cast you aside. But not God. He says, I'll never cast you aside. I will not, I will not cast aside a, a, a broken, bruised reed. But now, let's go on. He says there in the last part of that verse, in verse 20, in a smoking flax, he will not quench. It's the idea of a smoldering wick. 
It's not completely dead. Let me just illustrate it. This is not a candle. But most of you have uh, lit a match, or maybe if you couldn't find a match, you've you got a piece of paper, and, and somehow you got it lit. You turned on the stove and wadded it up, and, 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 and you got to get it somewhere. You know how that is? And, and it's, just, it's just a small flame. And you, know, you remember what you do when you, you got to get outside or get across the house, and that flame is just, is just about to go out? What do you do? You're, you're going, don't go out. Don't go out. And then when it starts to go out, you kind of cover it from the wind or whatever. That's the picture. Notice there in verse 20 again, a smoking flax he will not quench. Uh, That fire that is just about to go out, he's not going to go. What he's saying is, I have come and, and, and the Father has you and me in His hand. And wherever we are in our life, you know what He's saying? is He's saying, no, 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 no. Don't go out, don't go out. I got you, I got you. Stay with me, stay with me. I know, I know, you're, I know you're hurting right now. Just stay with me. Don't, don't go out. Until He can fan that, until He can get it to the point where He takes your smoldering wick and He lights a candle. Or he starts a fire. And then he takes, he will take our lives and what we in our sin were. He gets us into his family and he saves us. And then he begins to fan us into full flame. And where our lives without Christ were broken like those reeds. And we're about to give up and we're about to fizzle out like that smoldering wick. Jesus says to these scribes and Pharisees, don't get caught up in this and this. This is what I want you to understand. God's Word. Somebody's greater here than this temple. It's not about just revealing guilt. It is about revealing God. But I want you to understand, folks, he said, wherever these people are. He said, you know, my disciples, they were smoldering wicks. They were hungry. They were give out. They were weak. And you know what I'm about? I'm about giving strength to the weak. This man who was sick and needed healing, his flame was about to go out. And I'm about fanning that into flame. So this morning, I want to just challenge us. I don't know where you are in your relationship with Christ this morning, but I want to challenge us, if you don't know Christ, wherever you are in that spectrum. Some, you may not have a full understanding of God's Word. Can I tell you, one of the things that we're going to be doing pretty soon is starting a small group Bible study, a four-week study called Bible 101. It's designed to help us to understand what the Bible is about, uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, what it teaches. If you're interested, we would love for you to be involved in that. We want to help you to understand God's Word. But I also want to help you to understand this morning that Christ, whether, you've, whether you're not a believer or whether you've been serving Christ for many, many years, all of us find ourselves in that place where our, our flame of faith begins to dwindle. And Jesus Christ wants to step in and fan us into full flame.